Uh, my name is Jason Smith. This is lecture number four in the ABCs of Communism series. Um, today we're going to get to the stage of Stalinist socialism. Just a moment on the turn. Um, for many decades after the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, there was a discussion as to whether the way socialism developed in Russia uh, and the associated republics was um, a distinct stage in itself or was it some kind of deformation, a reflection of Stalin's peculiar personality? I think that after a century of experience, we can, more or less a century, we can say that uh, what we were witnessing is a distinct stage. It's one which many countries went through that have all of the same diagnostic characteristics, not just Russia and its republics, but also uh, China. And uh, we're going to be analyzing these as we go along. So I think that what we've been looking at is a distinct transitional stage. Does this mean that all uh, countries and all societies will go through a stage of Stalinist socialism? No, I don't think so, because the diagnostic factor of Stalinist socialism is scarcity. Russia and its republics and China were not anywhere near the level of industrial development that Karl Marx and Frederick Engels had hypothesized as the basis from upon which workers would take power. In their view, uh, all that really had to be done would in the advanced countries of England, France, Germany, and Italy, for example, United States, Japan, would be for workers to rise up and take over the means of production, change ownership in other words. And otherwise, things could be more or less as they were before. Of course, the state apparatus would change because you would have to have an army and police that were loyal to you and not to the previous owners, but that's a, essentially a small thing to accomplish. What happened is that the socialist revolutions occurred first in the most backward parts of the capitalist world, and that the first thing that these governments then had to tackle was to get the advanced industrial plant that they should have inherited. What that means in practice is that in the United States, for example, there's no need for a Stalinist socialist stage. We have everything we need to build socialism with extant. It's already here, if it doesn't all get shipped to other countries anyway in the meantime. At any rate, the, uh, and even if it did, American workers, the American population is intellectually and mentally prepared to do it all over again. Um, so. What we're going to go through here in the United States is going to be a very short period of uh, uh, transition and we should be able to move directly into communism without much difficulty whatsoever. The major slogan of com communism is from each according to our ability to each, each according to our needs and flows from the idea that the industrial basis for producing everything that one needs is in existence. We have that here in the United States. And what we don't have is a proper system of redistribution, as in all capitalist countries. So uh, to build communism here would be relatively simple once you have state power in your hands. won't require decades long of trying to acquire the things that were already acquired. Okay, with that comment in mind, I want to make just one other on, last, uh, on lecture number three. Uh, I realized as soon as we were getting it ready to put on YouTube that I uh, had made a, a serious mistake there. The Bessemer process uh, in the production of iron is a process where you blow cold air through the hot melt and it was perfected after the Civil War and then went into widespread use, but it didn't remove the phosphorus. It removed the carbon, excess carbon that was in that melt. What removed the phosphorus was the lining of those blast furnace melt pits with dolomite rock, which is magnesium carbonate. That gets the phosphorus out and removes it. So there's two different things going on, controlling the carbon content of the milk and getting the phosphorus out of it. Uh, but Bessemer is, refers really just to the blowing of the cold air through the milk, which quickly raises the temperature of the whole thing and uh, carburizes that extra, that extra carbon and gets rid of it, which is the secret to going from pig iron to wrought iron to steel. You have to have a decreasing amount of evenly distributed carbon atoms uh, with the iron. Okay, we got those two things done. Now let's get on to the discussion of the Bolshevik Revolution. The first thing I want you to understand as we proceed is that 
in any scientific study you need a model and you need a couple of keys in order to proceed accurately. Now what model did Lenin have for the Russian Revolution? And the answer to that is uh, not much. What he had was capital, which of course is a tremendous uh, analysis of the uh, way in which the capitalist system operates in all three volumes. And he also had uh, Marx's book on the Civil War in France, which referred to the first attempt of the working class in Europe to seize state power, uh, which only lasted a few months. Uh, he wrote a book about it, The Civil War in France, and uh, it's about the Paris Commune of 1870-71. to 71. But, as I say, they were only in power a few months. I won't spend much time on that, except to say that uh, Karl Marx afterwards was able to point out uh, what the things they did that were good and the things that were, and where they had made mistakes. So Lenin had that, if you can call it a model, to work from. Um, and uh, he had Marx's posthumously published critique of the Gotha program, which as you'll recall in the last lecture I ended up by pointing out that Marx was very unhappy with the Gotha program that the German Social Democrats had adapt, adopted in the German town of Gotha. And um, he um, had written a long paper denouncing it saying that the German Social Democrats had betrayed socialism completely. And they had, because they had jumped onto the uh, imperialist bandwagon, and they went ahead to prove how far, uh, uh, how far down the scale of, uh, of altruism they had sunk when they voted the credits for the Kaiser to start the First World War in, August, in July and August of 1914. Okay, but these, this is what he had to work with. Um, there are two keys that we're going to follow in our study of uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, and uh, those are going to be the life and the life history of Vladimir Ulyanov, who we know as Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, V.I. Lenin, and uh, Joseph Stalin. Now, these are the two men who are more than anything else directed the course of the Bolshevik Revolution. And in the course of these lectures, uh, you're going to see how and why in detail. Uh, chapter 13 is over 100 pages of the book of uh, uh, ABCs of Communism, Bolshevism, 2014. Virtually a book in itself, and it's all about uh, the subject matter that we're going to be talking about right now. Um, at, after, the, uh, after Karl Marx's death, in 1883, we Marxists were confronted with three primary enemies, anarchism, syndicalism, and revisionism. Let's take those one by one. The major difference between Karl Marx and the anarchists had uh, led to the dissolution of the First International. What was the First International? Well, in 1864, that is during the course of the, uh, the Americas were fighting their civil war, uh, the uh, the problem of scab labor coming from the continent of Europe into England was becoming so severe that even the most conservative British trade unions wanted to ally with radical uh, trade unionists and communists in England to uh, stop that. And they had uh, organized a conference in London in 1864, which Marx attended, and they had nominated him to be their general secretary and told him to write the inaugural address after the fact, which would be published, published as the inaugural address for the First International. The whole idea was to stop this importation of scab labor and to uh, uh, share among themselves uh, their defense fund so they could uh, call on one another in the event of strike actions. This is the, these are all trade union issues. There's a big difference between the strident tone in the Communist Manifesto of January 1848 that Marx wrote and the uh, inaugural address. It's well worth your time to look at it. Marx himself noted the difference in tone because this time he has to be a politician working among um, varied interests. And he certainly had no particular use for right-wing trade unionism, but on the other hand, he did have a tremendous use for the idea of bringing together all of the working class organizations uh, of Europe that he could. Um, 
they were opposed by anarchists, and the anarchists kept getting stronger in uh, countries that were members of the first, had, had unions that were members of the First International. Anarchists had gathered strength in Spain, in Russia, and in northern Italy, and um, they were able to send lots of delegates uh, to the international congresses, so much so that Marx, who had, was the boss from the beginning of the First International, the general secretary, decided to send the executive board to the United States. And in the United States, um, workers in Philadelphia decided the best thing they could do was uh, what Marx wanted them to do, which was simply to dissolve the organization altogether, and in that way keep it out of the hands of the anarchists. All right, well, what's wrong with anarchists? What do they actually believe in? Let's take a look at that really quickly. As you have seen, the state apparatus in our terms, that is, in Marx's terms, is the army and the police. Now, we, our position is that as long as you have class society, one class is going to dominate the other. And the, for 6,000 years, so this has meant that the exploiting and suppressing classes have the state in their hands and they use it against uh, workers and before workers against slaves and anybody in between that uh, is a problem for them. So, in other words, we say the state is a product of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms. The anarchists, on the other hand, say that the state is the source of all evil. This implies the idea that, and they will tell you if you can pin them down, that they believe that men want to inherently rule over one another. So that what they believe in is that you establish a political system where nobody can rule over one another. Well, this is anti-scientific because it, uh, first of all, we have the science of history and we have proven that the state is a product of classes. You can't have the state before classes and you won't have the state after classes. But at any rate, this is the theoretical differentiation which split Marxism from anarchism from the beginning and does to this very day, for that matter, because every time the working class has some hiccups and problems, the anarchists come back kind of like a syphilis or some kind of venereal disease that you can't fundamentally get rid of. At any rate, the other major enemy that we confronted at this uh, time was, and we're talking about uh, the late 1800s, revisionism. Now, uh, in the German Social Democratic Party, revisionism is all you had anymore. The, uh, the guys that wrote the Gotha program and that uh, people like Bernstein and who wrote Evolutionary Socialism, um, they're preaching a doctrine that society can evolve from one stage to the other without class struggle, without uh, class war. And um, I think that pretty well speaks for itself. That's obvious nonsense, but uh, that's what we were confronted with in Germany. In fact, all over Europe, and it, was, and it spread into the United States too. So this was revisionism of the classical type. Modern revisionism that we've come to fight in more recent years begins with Nikita Khrushchev and of course he had stooges all over the world including in this country. Uh, and then there was syndicalism. This was the theory in Europe that you could uh, change society, that workers didn't have to confront the state first, that they could simply take ownership of the shops and factories, occupy them and turn them into their own personal property. Um, syndicalism is in reality a reflection of the fact that these guys don't want to fight the bourgeois state. Our position always is, always has been, that you have to confront the bourgeois, the capitalist state, destroy it physically, meaning we have to have armed force in conflict with theirs, and we have to win in an armed struggle. Uh, that there can be no peaceful occupation of the factories and the shops, that the capitalists will never let you get away with that, and the whole idea is pie-in-the-sky nonsense. But those are the three things that we had to contend with in the late 1800s. Lenin was born in 1870, so for him, uh, by the time his brother was killed, um, it, was, uh, it was 1885, and the, these fights were at the center of Marxism versus everybody else. Stalin was only three years old uh, at the time that Marx died, and uh, Lenin was 15, I believe, or 13. But at any rate, there was an interregnum, therefore, between the time Marx died and the time that these men began to write and take the leadership of the movement. These are the things that were happening in that interregnum period. 
Now, I want to uh, go on to the fact that one of the things that differentiates Marxism from everybody else is that uh, is dialectical materialism. Just about everybody could understand the idea that one sociocultural stage is followed by another in terms of the advance in the arts of production and social relations that go along with them. Every anthropologist without any Marxist training whatsoever, for example, in our country, can see this in the ground in their archaeological courses. One social stage replaces another. Okay. What dialectical materialism does is teaches you to look for the internal causes in any given stage which will lead it to, into becoming its opposite. And when we're talking about in broad terms, for example, we said, why is it that in primitive communist society you have this primary directive of sharing everything and then in a few thousand years in the servitude epoch we have a primary directive of massive production but always in the hands of a very small ruling class. How did that transition happen? Well dialectically we have to be able to show exactly how it happened by internal processes which were occurring in the first which led it to transform into the second. Uh, we've started that in this course. But at any rate, um, I wanted to point out a, a few things. I'm going to use this as the uh, uh, to rem with my in 100 pages. We've got plenty of subheadings, and I can look at them and know what I want to go over. Okay, the first international then lasted from 1864 until 1876, and it uh, featured the Marxism becoming the dominant ideology among workers in all of Western Europe and North America, with the few exception of those in Northern Italy and Eastern and Northern Spain and some parts of Russia who fell under the uh, influence of the anarchists. In the United States we had something that was similar to that in terms of the utopian socialists. Um, there, were, there were then and there still are all kinds of people who think they can set up a commune in the forest someplace and adapt uh, advanced social relations of all kinds and that this will be the basis for the future of society. But of course this doesn't change the nature of production in the country in any way whatsoever. Um, utopian socialism pretty well fell by the uh, wayside by the time Lenin was ha confronted with the necessity of making changes in Russia itself. Now. In 1864, Marx became General Secretary of the First International, and he was able to uh, make it into a world power. For example, he uh, and his, his general, Frederick Engels, uh, who became the de facto Chief of Staff for the uh, uh, First International, um, wrote to uh, President Lincoln, offering their support, and uh, of course Lincoln, I'm sure, was glad to get it because what Marx was proposing to do, and what he did do, was to shut down the British construction of warships for the Confederacy. Um, all the, in other words, the first international step directly on the historical stage, and there was nothing happening at that particular moment historically more important than the U.S. Civil War. Um, there's a new book out by a man named Tristram Hunt, um, who was also a British labor MP, but a well-known scholar on socialist matters uh, called Marx's General. It was published in 2009 and um, in my view it's the best book ever written about, best biography ever written about uh, Frederick Engels. And it's called Marx's General. At any rate, um, there's something for you to uh, pick up and read in the library or, or wherever. Um, let's jump up to Lenin himself. The, um, Lenin was born in the eastern part of classical Russian area, which um, uh, in Simbursk, um, and his father was a czarist bureaucrat and a um, school teacher. His mother came from a fairly wealthy family. She always had an estate that produced, uh, uh, that is, had a, a, a 
of an estate being a, a kind of big plantation or farm-like situation. It had surf labor on it originally. Um, the, uh, it's interesting that the man that Lenin would eventually overthrow uh, was the son of the school teacher in, in where, where Lenin went to school. At any rate, we mentioned last time that up until the time that Alexander, his brother, was executed by the Tsar, um, Le Lenin was not what you'd call an exceptional person in any way. He was a happy-go-lucky uh, student leader type, athlete, um, without any discernible interest in politics. As soon as his brother was murdered by the Tsar, um, the, uh, he changed. And from that moment forward, he seemed to have not had any idea in mind other than to overthrow the Tsar's regime. What he did differ from, and he criticized his brother to himself and his friends many times thereafter, was the idea they had that if they assassinated the Tsar that that would somehow change something. He pointed out that, you know, this had been going on for a long time. People's will had assassinated Tsars and high government functionaries for many decades and it hadn't done any good. You get rid of one czar, you just get another one. What you had to do was to change the entire system. And that summer, he uh, studied Karl Marx for the first time, and he began to realize that what you had to do was to get rid of the entire capitalist system. This set him to work on his first major book, which was um, The Development of Capitalism in Russia, much of which had to be written in prison, because Lenin had, went to uh, Petersburg, and became a, a lawyer. And as a lawyer, he practiced what we would call personal injury and workman's comp. So he got quite a bit of quite a following from workers, and he and he made quite a bit of gains for them in the Tsar's courts to the degree that it was possible for them to fight the fine laws, for example, uh, because there were there was a code written into the Tsar's law that uh, allowed workers to contest fines that were imposed upon them. In those days, your employer would fine you for breaking a tool or for this or for that or whatever, and um, those fine laws could be contested. You'd get a lawyer uh, like Lenin, and he would uh, then uh, fight for you in the Tsar's courts. At this time, Lenin's name was Ulyanov, U-L-Y-A-N-O-V. Um, he would pick up the name Lenin pretty quickly. At any rate, he uh, didn't stop with just defending his uh, working class clients. He started organizing study circles. These, of course, got infiltrated by the secret police, and it wasn't long before they arrested him. And when they arrested him, he went to Saint Peter to the prison in St. Petersburg, and there he began writing in secret, of course, uh, his first book, The Development of Capitalism in Russia. He finished it later in Siberia when he was in exile. I'm skipping over a lot of these details, but that is uh, that book was published while he was in um, the Siberian exile and uh, under the name of Ilyin and Ilyin. Well, everybody knew who that it was Ulyanov that had written it, and Ilyin transformed in his next books into Lenin. So that's where the name comes from. Um, the uh, what I want to point out here is that from 1848 to 1903, which is the formation of Lenin's party, the Bolshevik party, um, what Karl Marx had done was to make the working class self-aware. Now you've seen movies, Terminator movies for example, where machinery becomes self-aware and all of a sudden begins to take on a life and a consciousness in a direction of its own. Well, <clears throat> people that had been enslaved, slavery lasted for in the old world for 5,000 years, in the new world for 1,000 years before it was cut short by the arrival of Spanish feudalists. That's a long time. Capitalism, by this time, had lasted, say, from 1875 until um, 1848 when Karl Marx published the Communist Manifesto. Now, that's a very short period of time, relatively speaking. From 1848 to 1903, Marxism, as we've seen, spread throughout most of the working class of the industrial world. Um, what he had done was to turn the proletariat into a self-aware class. They began to understand themselves as owners of labor power and understand themselves as 
people who cooperated in factories um, in order to produce goods. They became self-aware of their <coughs> existence as, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as a distinct class. Anyway, any rate, this is a point that you, it's an abstract point, but it's one that you should keep in mind. Now, while Lenin was in Siberia, a couple of interesting things happened. One is he got married. Now there's a couple stories about how this happened. The traditional story, which I still kind of like best, probably isn't accurate, is that his wife uh, showed up on his doorstep one day and uh, told him that she'd lied to the Tsar's police and they had sent her there. She would told them that she was his wife. Um, a more accurate story has been written, a, a biography of her in, in recent years, which is probably correct, which uh, uh, has her in constant contact with him by mail and courier. And Yes, she did tell the secret police that she was going to be married to them, him, and they said, okay, we'll send you out here to where he is in Krasnoyarsk, York, and, um, but you got to get married right away, like within a week or so, if you're going to stay there. So, one way or the other, this girl shows up. If you see a picture of her, she seems to, by, even by our terms, be quite a beautiful young woman. So, um, that's, uh, for whatever that's worth, that's where it is. So, she spent the next three years with him in exile out there in Siberia, and became his wife and practiced as well. They did get married and uh, to satisfy the police, not because they had any religious, obviously, uh, uh, compunctions about it. And uh, when uh, they got done, he left and left her behind for a few months and he went straight to Switzerland. Now, why Switzerland? Well, he was going there because at that time, that's where the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party intellectuals were hanging out. That's where they were based. So, in Zurich, so he went there and he joined up with them, and uh, that's how he got started with that group. They knew who he was by now because his book had been published, The Origin of Capitalism, in the Development of Capitalism in Russia, and everybody had read that, and uh, what he was proving is that Tsarist Russia was not a backward feudal country, that it was a, actually an, a full-fledged capitalist country with all these feudal uh, trappings on top of it. Now, Krupskaya, his wife, she followed him um, when she her time was up. She followed him out there. In the meantime, another man he had met uh, uh, in uh, Siberia had convinced him that the way to uh, finance this uh, revolution was with a series of bank robberies and ship robberies and, and stagecoach robberies in Georgia. And so that man took off and went to Georgia, where he linked up with uh, Leonid Krasin uh, and Joseph Stalin. Stalin was only 14 years old at this time, but he was already a troublemaker, uh, wor working in social democratic circles uh, in Tiflis, which is now Tbilisi. Stalin named Tbilisi Tbilisi in 1936, by the way, but at any rate, at that time it was called Tiflis, and it was the capital, it was the cultural center of the Caucasus Mountains, and it was the, the capital of Georgia. So, uh, <coughs> they, be <coughs> they, they began a series of uh, bank robberies uh, to support Lenin's uh, position and his, he, he had the publication. He went to Zurich with the idea of starting a newspaper that they called uh, Spark. In English we call it Spark. Iskra is what you call it in Russian. But at any rate, <coughs> what made this feasible uh, as far as the other social democrats, and there were many people that were well known among the social democrats of the world, like George Plekhanov, were there in Zurich. What made this feasible to them is that Lenin had the money to do it, which initially, at least, they uh, thought was because of his family. His mother, for example, had inherited this uh, permanent estate uh, uh, and had feudal serfs, and, they, uh, and it was uh, producing quite a bit of money. They really were unaware of the fact that Lenin had a whole gang of bank robbers working in the Caucasus. They'd figure this out eventually, but at this particular time, 
they didn't know it. It's important for you to know it because you can see several things. Lenin, first of all, had a real good grip, grip, grip on the real world and uh, understood the importance of money. If you didn't have money, the best you would be would be somebody hanging around a coffee house and shooting your mouth off with other people similarly poverty-stricken and situated. If you had money then, and you knew how to use it, you could start to plan an armed revolt. Okay. In 1903, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party held a congress in London and they brought members that uh, were able to get through the Tsar's controls and uh, get out of Russia and of course their group from Switzerland and they all met in uh, London and they hammered out uh, a program for political action which was centered around distribution of their newspaper Iskra or Spark to working class centers in Russia. and. Uh, that is uh, exactly what they did. So, um, that group split into two parts. This, by the way, is when Leon Trotsky first comes into the picture. He uh, had uh, just gotten out of uh, jail in Russia and uh, came from a well-to-do Jewish family who would have been minor nobility if they hadn't been Jewish. At any rate, he had money of his own. He had a, he had a record now, which a uh, prison record, which meant that he was acceptable to this bunch. Um, they, uh, he at first sided with Lenin in this 1903 conference. Toward the end, he split with him, and stayed split up until a few months before the October Revolution. The two the Bolsheviks were always considered Trotsky to be an enemy during all those years, 1903 to 1917. Any rate, that's an aside. The important thing here is that Lenin's group won the votes at the RSDOP meeting because they had a majority of votes, and that Russian word for majority is Bolshevik. Those that were in the minority, or the Russian word is Menshevik for minority, um, went back to Europe and headquartered again in Zurich. This time Lenin went back to Switzerland and headquartered in Geneva. So from that time forward, the Bolsheviks were based in Geneva, the Mensheviks were based in Zurich, and for the most part they held separate conferences, had completely separate organizations, sharing only one thing, the name Rosh Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, after which in parentheses it would be either Bolshevik or Menshevik. So there comes the name Bolshevik and Bolshevism. After the 1917 revolution everybody forgot about the Mensheviks as far as the world is concerned, and uh, communism as a word became interchangeable with Bolshevism. But for those who are hardline ideologues, uh, it's important to separate the... There are many different parties who consider themselves to be communists, but if you, uh, if you want to be part of the Leninist tradition, then it's useful to use the word Bolshevism, which is one reason, of course, we use it in this book, ABCs of Communism, Bolshevism 2014. It doesn't say Trotskyism or Visionism or Syndicalism or Menshevism or any other. Thing. It says Bolshevism 2014, and this is the 10th edition. Uh, I set it up that way to begin with to make it clear what side of this kind of a historical divide I'm on. Okay, uh, let's go on from 1903 to 1905. A couple of things happened in 1905 which were of great importance. One is that the, um, the uh, well, in 1904, the Russian Navy was defeated terribly by the Japanese Navy. Now this is something that nobody had anticipated. Um, how could a primitive country like Japan field a navy that was uh, capable of sinking the Tsarist Navy? Every single Tsar ship in that conflict was sunk. And of course all of their hands uh, were lost at sea. The only ones that survived it were the soldiers and sailors that were still on land. This set up a tremendous opposition to the Tsar back in Russia, and in 1905 the first revolution, first Russian revolution started. The uh, Bolsheviks, that is Lenin and his group in Geneva, as soon as the armed revolt against the Tsar started, he rushed back to the Russian border. At this time, they headed back to Galicia, which now is the center of fascist reaction. But at that time, uh, was very was one of those areas that was very anti-Czarist, and um, 
was, uh, welcomed uh, Lenin with open hands, open arms, and also all the way up to Finland. All those border areas Lenin and his boys were uh, working in. Now, who did he bring with him? Well, he brought Leonid Krasin, who was his number one bank robbing boss, and uh, and one other man uh, who you don't need to worry about his identity at this particular point, but the point is these three became known in socialist circles as the Bolshevik Holy Trinity because they made all the decisions for the Bolshevik Party during 1905 and 1906. Lenin set the date of April 1906 for a nationwide uprising organized by his guys against the Tsar, his Bolsheviks, and they had by this time acquired huge quantities of guns. Uh, and they, they had the money because they'd been conducting thousands of robberies and um, they sent uh, different men to different places to make these purchases um, and they bought machine guns and heavy weapons of all kinds everywhere from Japan to England and Germany and uh, put them on ships and began sending them to the Gulf of Finland or put them on uh, ships that they were able to get up toward the Caucasus on the Black Sea, um, getting in position for the April Revolt. Lenin decided to set it for April 1906 because that's when the surviving army and navy men from uh, Korea and Manchuria were supposed to get back to Moscow. And in those days especially that wasn't a fast trip so it had taken them a while to get back there. It was but they were supposed to get back at that time, and Lenin knew that they were in very angry mood, quite ready to fight for the overthrow of the Tsar. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, in the meantime, in the time he had gained uh, over the latter part of uh, 1905 and the early part of 1906, the Tsar managed to get in a position to suppress most of his enemies, and the Bolsheviks were never, never able to pull off their armed struggle at that time. Now, it would be another nine years until he got a shot at it again. And we're going to pick that particular subject up again in the next lecture when we talk about the uh, Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. But these are major events which were occurring up until that time. The interregnum period between 1906 and 1917 of 11 years were uh, years where Lenin was often in the wilderness because he wasn't able to do very much much like Winston Churchill was between the wars in the 1930s, uh, unable to do very much, a man alone in the wilderness. And uh, Maxim Gorky in 1911 or 1912 said, uh, a famous Russian intellectual, said of Lenin that he had been reduced to being a bandit chief without any bandits. Well, the one thing Lenin did have was an absolutely correct political line, and he continued to write uh, serious theoretical works, the last of which prior to the revolution he started was called State and Revolution, and that was a justification for uh, what the Bolsheviks had to do. Um, Lenin's position was real clear, and that is, without state power, that is, without the army and the police in our hands, we could do nothing that we want to do. Uh, with state power, the army and police in our hands, we can do everything that we want to do. So what that means is, we have to uh, do everything possible, move heaven and earth to overthrow the Tsarist army and police and create our own army and police. Now that was uh, how Leninism boiled down in practice. And what the, the armed robbery teams that continued to work in the Caucasus um, were one thing, but what they also did was they provided the nucleus for the movement of Bolshevik literature up into the industrial cities of Russia. And all you had to do, what they had been doing anyway for a long time, was to follow the route of the distribution of petroleum products. That, pro that was uh, essentially going across the Caucasus Mountains from Batum to Baku, getting on a ship, moving that oil all the way up to the mouth of the Volga River at Astrakhan, manhandling that onto the uh, barges that went on up into uh, uh, what then was called Tsaritsyn and became Stalingrad, uh, and then Moscow, and then uh, Leningrad, or in those days, St. Petersburg. So, um, this is the kind of day-to-day -day activity they were involved in. Yes, bank robbing, uh, 
and ship robbing and so on continued because the Bolsheviks had a pretty they had to, uh, had a pretty big payroll they had to make on a regular basis of secret organizers and uh, they had the press they had to maintain but they weren't getting anywhere near uh, to the actual launching of a struggle for state power until it actually happened in February 1970. Now, by this time, Lenin was, when the February Revolution broke out, Lenin was in Switzerland, and he heard about it from his neighbors who came pounding on his door saying, there's been a revolution in Russia. Uh, he and his wife and everybody else rushed down to a part of uh, Geneva where there were newspapers posted on the walls and for people regularly done, so for people to read. Uh, there was a big Russian emigre community, so they were all out there reading about what had happened in Russia. And what had happened is that uh, there had been a revolt in uh, February in the army. That had There had been many revolts in the army, but this one had led to the uh, abdication of the Tsar. And there was a new government in power in uh, Petrograd. The name of St. Petersburg had been changed by the Tsar to Petrograd for what he called patriotic reasons. That was the capital of the empire, and so uh, there was a new government there headed by a, a man named uh, Kerensky. Kerensky's father was the one who'd been the school teacher for Lenin when he was in elementary school in Simbirsk. At any rate, the uh, Kerensky government was a capitalist government, and uh, Lenin denounced it as such, and immediately went to work trying to figure out how to get back to Russia. Now, it wasn't long before everybody knew that when he got back that he'd gotten back with the connivance of the Germans, but the Bolshevik press tried to make as little of that as they could. But notice this, there was a Bolshevik press. They had several newspapers and magazines that were coming out on a, a daily and weekly basis. Where did the money come from? Well, when Lenin got back to Finland Station in Petrograd, he got back with a lot of money. And uh, where did he get the money? Well, this was more money than they would have been able to accumulate by ongoing bank robberies out of the Caucasus. He got it from the German general staff. Now, to get back to uh, Russia, first of all, he had to cross Germany, and he set up something he called a um, sealed train. Why, why? Well, so he could deny that he was doing what he was doing. The idea was, the German train would pick them up at the Swiss border and take them across Germany and not allow them off of the train or anybody to get on it. The train was supposed to be sealed. But in reality what happened is it was sidetracked in Berlin and Lenin went straight to a meeting with the German general staff. Now they knew him very well. They'd been financing the Bolsheviks off and on for years. Why? Well, because the Bolsheviks wanted to get Russia out of the war and they would do anything to get Russia out of the war. They supported a policy called revolutionary defeatism. In uh, Berlin, Lenin convinced them that it was time to go for broke, that he could seize state power, and they believed that he could or they wouldn't have been fi financing him all this long. Remember, they knew that he had gotten close to it in 1906 and that he'd been building up his power base ever since in Russia, and they were rather convinced that the Bolsheviks could seize state power. So they agreed to finance him, and. Uh, when he came back to, uh, by the time he got back on the train, went to Finland, got on another train, went to uh, the, uh, what they call Finland Station in Petrograd. By the time he got off that train, he had, he had uh, plenty of cash on hand and more being bank wired to him. The man that got off the train with him in, Len in Petrograd was Joseph Stalin. Stalin and several others had gone down to uh, meet him uh, outside, of, meet his train outside of uh, uh, Petrograd, and uh, right then and there, Stalin, uh, Lenin made it clear that he wouldn't have anything to do with these other guys that had come with him, and uh, because of the crap that they'd been writing in the Bolshevik press about collaborating with the capitalist government, and it was, so it was Stalin that got off the train with Lenin, and Lenin got a reception from over a hundred thousand workers that were Nobody before or since that re return would get any kind of reception like that. And uh, there was an honor guard of uh, soldiers and sailors, an honor guard of workers and so on to salute him. These were the days when motion picture cameras, cameras had just been developed, so 
We have a motion pic picture record of his arrival at Finland Station. The spotlights, like a Hollywood movie gala, were shooting off into the sky. I mean, it was a full-fledged production. And the first thing Lenin said when he got off the train was death to the provisional government, overthrow the capitalist system, and uh, this put uh, the Bolsheviks that had been collaborating in Russia in uh, quite a tizzy because they hadn't expected it, such an open call for an armed revolt against the provisional government like that. Well, that kicks off the period between from uh, the time that Lenin arrived in early March uh, to uh, the October. Now, there was a two, about a two-week time difference between dates at that time in the West and the dates on the Russian calendar, but we'll go ahead and use the uh, dates that were that are in the literature. So, <clears throat> on April of their time, Lenin went to the St. Peter's, the Petrograd. Uh, Soviet. Now, Soviet is a Russian word for council. So the idea was when Lenin said all power to the Soviets, he meant all power to these workers' councils or soldiers' councils or sailors' councils that were being had been and were being set up all over the country. And um, in, in April, he now we're talking 1917, he'd only been back a short time when he delivered his what we call the April thesis, ten different points which became known as the Bolshevik Ten Commandments um, about what he wanted to be, to be done. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll go through those in more detail in the next lecture. But I want to some, give you a summary overall picture first today. Now, from this point on, there's something else that's really important for you to take a look at. And that is that Stalin is back. He was back in time to meet Lenin by getting on the train, uh, going out to where the train was coming in, getting on the train with Lenin, coming back to Finland Station with him. And from that time on, he assumed the role that he'd actually been playing in the Bolshevik Party all along. He was the paymaster. He was the guy that knew everybody in the Bolshevik Party in Russia. Uh, he, he, had, he was in charge of meeting their payroll, uh, which was substantial. The, uh, we're talking about having to pay thousands of rubles per week now to cadres and agitators and pay for the uh, newspapers and magazines that the Bolsheviks were printing in unlimited quantities. Uh, he took over all of these organizational responsibilities because he'd been doing it all along before when he wasn't in exile. And it was just natural for him to be the one that did it. Now, there are a couple of things that happened in 1917 which are going to be mentioned quickly because this is an overview lecture today. Uh, in July, workers and sailors and soldiers had been constantly stirred up by Bolshevik agitators to seize state power. Now, Lenin was sick in the months when they made their attempt to do it, I mean in the days when they made their attempt to seize state power in July, and he was uh, actually hiding out in, in Finland at that moment trying to recover. It was the first of these bouts of high pressure. Uh, we can see today that he was sick because of high blood pressure. In those days, not very much was known about this sort of thing, but so at any rate, he wasn't in Petrograd at the key moment when the decision was made by the uh, so soldier Soviet to seize state power, and the Bolshevik, uh, the Bolshevik command uh, decided to go along with it. That is, the guys that published the newspaper, uh, Soldier, um, uh, d decided to tell the workers of, uh, and soldiers in Petrograd at the time it comes to overthrow the Tsar by armed force and seize state power. Now, Lenin wasn't there, but when he got back he was highly pissed off. He said, you guys should be thrashed for this. And he, um, he directed Stalin to find a, a, make some kind of agreement with Kerensky right away that would let the Bolsheviks retain their newspapers and have personal safe conduct out of their headquarters and he would send all the workers home, which is what happened. But, and Kerensky agreed. He agreed for a couple of reasons. That, uh, what he, of course, he would have liked nothing better than to kill these Bolshevik agitators, but on the other hand, he was confronted by the fact that there were czarist generals in Moscow, one of which was this guy Kornilov, was already threatening to march on Petrograd and hang all the Social Democrats, including Kerensky, who as far as he was concerned, any social democrat was too far left to him. 
So Kerensky realized that he was probably going to need these Bolsheviks pretty quickly. And within two weeks he did need them. And he, this time, however, he had friendly relations with Stalin. Kerensky came to Stalin and he asked him if, they, if the Bolsheviks would come to the defense of the, of the government. Stalin said, well, Lenin will have to decide this. Lenin's back now full time. Lenin said, yeah, we can do that, but they've got to arm the workers in the Vyborg district. You've got 150,000 pissed off workers out there who will be happy to fight but you're going to have to give them guns. That means you're going to have to take the army's armory and empty it. Give it to the workers. Kerensky agreed, oh yes, I'll do that. He agreed because he really didn't have any choice. Kornilov was getting closer and closer to uh, Petrograd all the time on trains from Moscow. Well, at any rate, the, uh, this is how the workers got arms when the time came. From that time forward, Kornilov was suppressed. They chased him out towards Siberia, caught him, and killed him. Uh, his army men revolted against him, and that was the end of that threat. But there were other generals that were coming. Uh, anyway, it was too late. The Bolsheviks weren't going to give the guns back. The workers in Petrograd weren't going to turn. So they were permanently armed. So now the Bolsheviks have what they always wanted, and that was a large number of pissed-off and well-armed industrial workers at their command. It was only a matter of time now. And uh, the countdown for the revolution began in September, and they set the date for October, and uh, Lenin was at that meeting. Every Bolshevik leader was there. This is actually the formation of the first political bureau, um, the Politburo that be, uh, being the highest level of authority within every central committee and every communist party. This has its origin in the seizure committee of uh, the Bolshevik Seizure Committee. Now, as a matter of interest, and it's an important point, Lenin invited Trotsky to join the Bolsheviks again, despite all the years of hostility between them. And the only one that liked this idea in the Bolshevik party was Lenin. Everybody else hated the idea. The, the average members of the party hated Trotsky and didn't want anything to do with him. But Lenin saw one thing about Trotsky that was really important. Despite all the things where we might disagree, we have are in agreement on one thing, and that is the importance of seizing state power right now. And he knew that Trotsky had a spellbinding effect on people that were willing to listen to the song and dance that he did in the uh, at the Petrograd Circus building where the Soviet was uh, having its daily meetings, and he could use that. So he managed to convince Trotsky to join the Bolsheviks. Trotsky's negotiating position was uh, very offensive to the rest of the Bolshevik party. For example, he wanted them to drop the name Bolshevik, which they certainly weren't about to do. At any rate, finally Trotsky agreed to go along with Lenin because he was smart enough to see that Lenin has something that he would never have, and that is a well-funded, well-organized combat organization that is ready to spring into action and seize state power which he, like Lenin, knew that that was the most important thing. So in July, um, now the revolution is going to happen in October, so we're only like three months away. My point is that Trotsky was a very late coming Bolshevik. Nobody wanted him in the party except for Lenin, so he really had to work hard to make, uh, make himself acceptable to the rest of them. But you know, in Trotsky's mind, he thought that he could become Lenin's successor. We'll see where he took steps in that direction. But that was never in the cards. That was never feasible. Nobody else in the Bolshevik Central Committee would have supported Trotsky as successor to Lenin. And um, that's a subject we'll get to in the next lecture. But I wanted you to be aware that he has re-entered the picture. So everybody that Lenin had with him in Switzerland is now in Russia. They're now in this seizure committee meeting in Petrograd, which is being held in secret, along with him. Only two men vote against the armed seizure of power, uh, and uh, Zinoviev was one of them. The, uh, the, th this has ramifications anyway. Everybody else agreed with Lenin. Now Lenin has to go into hiding because the uh, <clears throat> when he's not at a meeting like this, he's got to be hiding in Finland because the secret, the secret police from the capitalist government 
are looking for him and they're going to kill him if they can find him. The only man that knows where he is is Stalin. Stalin's job is keep Lenin hid and uh, safe. So he's the connection between the uh, Central Committee and, and Lenin. And this has been going on ever since the July days when uh, uh, Lenin had had to leave after this abortive Bolshevik uprising. And uh, it continues right up until the eve of the actual seizure. So Lenin had to keep sending these guys letters. Move now. Because despite the fact that they had voted for it, accepted the date, and so on and so forth, he knew that there was a lot of foot dragging back there. And that it wasn't just Zinoviev and uh, that who uh, uh, had gotten cold feet. They were all very nervous about the whole thing. After all, this had never been done in the history of the world. In recorded history, no group of trade unionists and radical communists had ever been able to see state power, form a government, and get away with it. Um, so they knew that this. once they made that move, then they were all in. They either had to be successful or they were going to die. And uh, that is that was making them very hesitant about actually pulling the trigger. But at any rate, Lenin was so unhappy about this that he left Finland, came back to the Vyborg district, Stalin knew where he was, uh, again he disguised himself, shaved his beard, walked all the way to the party headquarters in, uh, in Petrograd, and by the time he got there, the armed struggle had started. Now in the next uh, uh, in the next lecture, we'll pick it up from the point at which Kerensky fired the first shot. But if he hadn't, the Bolsheviks were going to fire it that day anyway. It just happens that Kerensky's men rushed over to shut down the Bolshevik press, and they succeeded in doing that. But within a short period of time, Stalin's Red Guards rushed over and defeated them in an armed shootout and reestablished their control over it. And shortly after that, Trotsky, who was now in charge of the Bolshevik I mean, of the Petrograd Russian Army garrison, sent his guys over to be sure that the, uh, the Kerensky forces would not get another attempt at that. At the same time, uh, the seizure committee started carrying out the plan, which was seize the railroad office, seize the telegraph office, seize the telephone exchange, seize the post office, seize the banks, uh, seize the armories, bring over the Peter and Paul garrison. They had all of this stuff lined up. They had agents everywhere, agitators and so on, and everything was falling into place. To summarize this whole thing, the seizure of state power in Petrograd happened quickly. Within a couple of days, the entire city was in Bolsheviks' hands, and there had been very little bloodshed. All the Tsarist ministers, or all of the provisional government ministers, had been arrested in the Winter Palace. The Navy had come over to the Bolsheviks. Uh, the thing was over as far as the capital was concerned. However, in every other city in Russia, there was a, um, in Moscow, Kiev, um, Odessa, every place you can think of where it was a major uh, concentration of, of uh, people, especially industrial workers, there was an active armed struggle going on that lasted two to three weeks. So the idea that uh, Ted Dasa shook the world ended up in a peaceful transition in to uh, socialism in Russia is true as far as Petrograd is concerned, but completely false as far as the rest of the country is concerned. And we're going to pick that up in the next lecture also. Uh, so with that, I think we'll conclude for today and uh, get ready for the onset of uh, the details of the seizure and the Civil War which followed. The Civil War is going to last until the, uh, until the end of 1922.